Wonderful. Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Nicholas Demancho, Head of Architecture here at MIT, and I welcome uh, our whole community, visitors, and guests online to this evening's lecture uh, in our departmental lecture series. Um, uh, I will um, speak briefly at the beginning, then introduce my colleague Nasser Rabat to um, introduce tonight's lecture. Um, we're, we're all very excited about I'm about to read, um, I'll just say a few words about what I'm about to read, particularly um, in the context of the current moment. Um, uh, when I came to this department in the spring of 2020, um, we introduced um, only a few uh, months before MIT released a, an attempt at the official statement, imperfect um, uh, of land acknowledgement that I'm about to read. We began a process uh, in consultation with the faculty to introduce a land acknowledgement to our, to our lecture series. And um, while my uh, history and background is not nearly as interesting as most, frankly, most members of our community, um, I do uh, uh, trace my roots and upbringing to Australia, where my family were um, uh, uh, French settlers and arrivals in the 19th century. And the land acknowledgement, which has been a feature of Australian public events since the 1990s, since the Mabo decision uh, outlawed the concept of terra nullius in uh, Australian law, um, has been a really important part of that country and that con uh, continent's attempts to reconcile with the multiple uh, populations and indigenous populations in particular, of course, belied by the outcome of the recent um, uh, Voice to Parliament plebiscite, um, uh, which presents huge challenges to Australia society at the moment. But the land acknowledgement as a, as a factor in what positive moves have been made is very legible to, to Australians and was part of my um, uh, interest in raising the question with our faculty, which I'm very happy um, got their support. So with that, um, uh, uh, and with a kind of consciousness over the importance of understanding, sharing, and experiencing the history of territory, um, I will say that MIT acknowledges indigenous people as the traditional stewards of the land and the enduring relationship that exists between them and their traditional territories. The land on which we sit tonight is the traditional unceded territory of the Wampanoag Nation and also Massachusetts people. We acknowledge the painful history of genocide and forced occupation of their territory, and we honor and respect the many diverse indigenous people connected from time immemorial on this land on which we now gather. Thank you very much, Nasser Rabat. Hi, everyone. My name is Nasser Rabat, and I'm the uh, I'm professor for Islamic architecture here at the Department of Architecture. It's an honor for me to introduce my friend, Lina Gutmey. I have met Lina on the 14th cycle of the Khan Award for Architecture in 2021. She served on the jury, I served on the steering committee. I was fascinated by her story. A woman architect from Lebanon with an international repertoire and an international reputation who carved a solo practice in Paris by dent of her strategic moves perseverance, creativity, and clarity of goal. Those were late night talks, so I extracted that from them. I was also fascinated by her sense of the moment, of nature, of history, and of taste. For if Lena were not an accomplished architect, she would be a cutting edge fashion designer. Rotme's Paris-based studio, Lina Rotme Architecture, came out of an earlier practice with two colleagues that was called BGT that she co-established in 2005. Before that, Lina worked with Jean Louvel Architects and Fosters and Partners. She was first recognized for the Estonian National Museum, designed in partnership with DGT, and later the Stone Garden Tower in Beirut, winner of the design uh, 2021 project of the year and distinguished for its hand carved surface which anchored the city eventful past into the present by calling forward its ruins after the civil wars, histories of conflicts and scarred landscape. More recently, Lina completed the workshops for Hermes in Louvier, Normandie, France, 
The first low carbon energy positive building delivered in France, the workshops for Hermès established a symbiosis, title of our lecture, with the landscape while bridging craft, beauty, and today's high technicity. Her evocative arcades with their brick arches are hard to place in any one tradition, but together recall the millennia of building traditions around the Mediterranean and further east. Her current at table architectural exhibit, the 22nd Serpentine Pavilion in London, which opened in June 2023, rises as a wooden structure in keeping with the natural surrounding. It's a table that is inviting you to partake in a meal together. It is built predominantly from biosources and low carbon materials. The pavilion continues her focus on sustainability and the design of spaces that are conceived in dialogue with their environment and the traditions in which the function is rooted. In this case, the craft of leather making for which the brand is famous, going back to the Hermes workshop. She recently won the Contemporary Art Museum in Al Ula in Saudi Arabia a city under construction to become a hub of tourism with many, many um, cultural projects um, under consideration or under uh, construction. Evoking an old world cosmopolitanism which graced Lina's native city, Beirut, and many cities that dynamically functioned as bridges between cultures, Lina sees her practice as an archaeology of the future. Each project evolves from her research as an expression of the essence of the raw material from which it is crafted. Archaeology of the future is an approach to the built landscape in which every project is drawn from its place and the traces of its past. In her design, Lina connects time, memory, and space. The past meets the future as histories are unearthed and memories excavated to enable questioning, innovation, and a more sustainable architecture. Bearing a humanist approach, something that I personally consider to be a must in architecture, Lena Rotme's practice emphasizes the power of craft and that of the hand in the making of architecture. Through this, the build embraces the traditions of its localities while uplifting the subjective experience and the collective memory of those it recalls. Lina has a long list of achievements. They were produced in the poster. I have them here, but I'm not going to read them. Um, she had served as professor in multiple places, had received so many awards, and many of them actually are totally unknown to me. Um, but I am very happy to welcome Lina to our lecture series with her lecture, Living in Symbiosis, an Archaeology of the Future. Please join me in welcoming Lina. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nasser, for such a wonderful introduction. And thank you for having me. Thank you, Hashem, Rania, everyone, to have me with the, for this lecture at MIT. I'm honored. Uh, and I'll be very happy to share with you the process of making, the process of designing, and how the projects come ab about actually uh, with my team, with my practice. I don't know if we can turn off the lights. I hope you don't sleep, but it will allow us to see better the, the screen. Uh, so basically, always when starting any project, we're always looking at Earth. Uh, this is very particular to our profession as architects and uh, very beautiful actually because it reminds us that uh, we are all interconnected, that we all share the same space, that we, we have to take care of uh, this habitat in which we are uh, dwelling. And we know that today humanity has become a dominant force in shaping the face of Earth, not only in the shaping of Earth, unfortunately, also in the destruction and the modification of this uh, Earth. So if we continue in our way of uh, making, we need more than two Earths to sustain our consumption. And this is something that we clearly see in some contexts, like uh, Beirut, I grew up in the city, 
This is a photo uh, done uh, by Joe Kisarwani where we can see like this uh, mass of concrete that invades the city permanently. But also we see how the sea is able to always soothe again uh, this vista uh, and this contradiction between the built and the natural uh, that are combined. Another photo that I took also in uh, Beirut, uh, just really across the site where we, uh, where I built this project, uh, Tower of Stone Garden, and we can see this uh, situation also of inhabiting, like inhabitation, and how this the the, the context in which today we are in this. Uh, moment of uh, re rebuilding or building out of uh, resources. It questions uh, what are the resources that we are building with, what, what do we have as material to build with. And then moments of uh, also uh, waste. I feel like it's uh, beeping actually. Maybe I can uh, use the mic. Okay, and we can see here, for example, how uh, waste is rendered visible in this city. It's the same. We have to take uh, <laughs> used to it. Uh, and we can see also like uh, something that is more rendered visible actually in uh, Lebanon, waste. I mean, it is everywhere except here we can see it. So it reminds you uh, of the uh, global uh, challenge that we have. Th one thing that is interesting in the Anthropocene is also that uh, it uh, reminds us that there is, should be an end of this binary vision that we can have with the environment and that we are not actually separated from that environment and the dichotomy actually between the Earth and the world does not really exist uh, or between us and the Earth. And scientists mostly tell us that we are actually more microbes than humans and that we are, uh, as cells, composed of 57% uh, of microorganisms and only 43% uh, are actually human cells. And this is where some paintings of Archimboldo are maybe right. We are made of vegetables, we're made of nature. So that questions us uh, how much nature there is in architecture maybe literally uh, looking at how nature grows of uh, ruins, grows in the city. And this is something that is very much present in uh, scenes in uh, Lebanon or in Beirut, where every time we see an archaeology emerging, because the city has been uh, uh, destroyed, uh, we, we, we hear that Beirut has been uh, covered seven times because of uh, the different earthquakes. But every time we unveil archaeologies, we see nature coming through and uh, invading the city in an organic way. And it's possible to bring life even in moments where we see these informal constructions. And these inform actually the way of uh, making spaces. Moments also where I took photos of these archaeologies that emerge in the city, uh, where sometimes when a tower is going to be built, uh, we discover actually the history of, uh, of Beirut, uh, and we discover these traces. They disappear very quickly afterwards uh, because there is no archaeological uh, plan of uh, conservation. And these moments, these sporadic moments, question actually what we are building, how also these traces uh, whether in the space and in, in Earth. Uh, I'd like to think also of architecture as an act of emergence, almost like this obelisk that was found in Egypt that was still under construction, that is shaped really by the context, by the resources of the place, by this uh, rock actually that is carved, that is uh, uh, being uh, like uh, transformed by the hand of people. So every time we're uh, engaging in a project, we're looking at history, we're looking at how uh, we, we build in our uh, landscape or how the buildscape is shaped, and how maybe thinking uh, about architecture as, uh, as an act of unearthing, of really uh, linking to the ground, and as a process of transformation, uh, rather than a process of building anew, actually, that links to uh, like uh, to, to an anchorage into uh, the history of typologies and their evolution. 
So the process of making is one that is multifaceted. It goes from uh, questioning, like every typology, what is a museum, what is a house, what, what are, why are we doing such a project? And that uh, takes shape into different referential uh, images, histories, theories, uh, and the uh, shapes of model, of making uh, samples or imagery. Uh, and dialogues that are constantly in uh, in the making in the office. Models also allow to uh, to sense the space, to to imagine how do we deal with uh, with the inhabiting of a certain context. The hand is always present as an act of making sketches, and and these are important because they are they bring us uh, back to the link that we have to the environment. And this process really is applied to multiple scale, whether the scale of, uh, of the hangar in a certain uh, uh, restaurant design. Uh, for example, this is an illustration of a small hangar in a restaurant where there is a bar that is made in earth, uh, or a design of a chair uh, where we really listen to the material, but also we listen to the tools uh, that are behind the making of any chair or any uh, fixture in a restaurant, looking also to artisans' work, like craft, for example, this is work with, uh, with glass, and then cooking glass, and then glass becoming a material afterwards, and becoming an insertion in a chocolate uh, boutique in, uh, in Paris, or really thinking about craft as uh, and exhibition as a way to value craft that has been forgotten. For example, this is in Japan, looking at these uh, potteries that are just left out in industries because the young generation becomes uninterested in, in such a work that is not maybe considered to be contemporary. So the exhibition here is about really bringing this uh, back into contemporaneity, making the young generation interested in such a, in such a work. So this is a micro scale of making that is really interesting, where it's not about the architecture or the building, but it's about the experience, about the light, with about the community, and about discovering a culture, and maybe learning from it to bring something, an ingredient, into architecture uh, afterwards. So if we uh, come to think about architecture and we like to, uh, you know, to rationale, uh, to give a rationale actually to what we make as architects, and architecture is a complex uh, act. It's uh, maybe for for me it's situated between archaeology. Archaeology implying an act of digging, of unearthing, of researching, of looking at the past, uh, looking at the place as stories. Uh, and uh, maybe memory of the place uh, between uh, humanity because we're looking at an architecture that could be inclusive, that talks about society, talks about uh, humanism, about craft, about establishing relationships or other relationships between nature because this is our environment, this is where we're connecting, connected to the living, uh, and we're trying to nurture such an environment, such an ecology, and bring beauty into what we make. And the future, as, as every act of architecture, also draws a certain newness, even if it's an innovation, it's always about a finding an, emergen an emergence, actually, or an originality that we're looking for. So from that, I would like to uh, look at different facets, actually, also uh, at this architecture that is situated between the archaeology of the future and maybe more linked to my upbringing in Beirut. How can architecture also be a mode of resilience or resistance, a word that is also at uh, question in, in the context of Lebanon and the geopolitics, actually, at the moment of uh, our context? So. One question was about resisting occupation, and this is uh, more specific to a project that uh, we developed in Estonia. Uh, Nasser, you talked about it shortly in the introduction. Uh, this is Estonian National Museum in Tartu. Uh, and uh, what is very particular to Estonia uh, is that uh, the country had uh, lived the Soviet occupation after multiple occupations uh, priorly and had uh, had its independence in 91. And it joined the European Union in 2003 and launched this international competition for the National Museum 
as a quest somehow to build this uh, identity or to reaffirm their identity and their struggle of collecting ma various objects to to reaffirm also this link to uh, you know agriculture. So it was really fascinating because uh, Estonia is located really south of Finland and the museum uh, was meant to be built in Tartu. The brief of this competition was really amazing because it had uh, this ethnographic uh, content to it and uh, the outlook to identity as a as a manner of, con like as an open uh, process rather that, uh, than an enclosed process. And Tartu uh, is not the culture, it's not the capital of Estonia, so Tallinn is the capital, and we have here an Estonian who, who will uh, also tell us more <laughs> about this country, because there is always a confusion. People tell me, where is Estonia actually? Is it like Latvia? It's like, no, it's really above uh, Lithuania. And uh, we can see uh, that Tartu was the cultural capital. It's the place where uh, a lot of folk uh, dance were happening. Uh, it's also this uh, culture that is very much to uh, link to a matriarchal society where women were also about uh, uh, making uh, resistance through the knitting that they were doing. Uh, also these objects of collection that uh, are important because of their narrative, because they actually confirm that uh, belonging to this nation, to this land in which they are sitting. One of the particularity of uh, this uh, context uh, where the museum was about to, to be set uh, is that it is located uh, really uh, close to the city center, but a few minutes away. Uh, and uh, it's almost unurbanized in a way it's uh, less dense uh, than the city center. Uh, and it's in uh, an area called Radi. One particular thing about this area is uh, that the first uh, museum establishment was uh, set there by an ethnographer, uh, ethnographer uh, called Jacob Hurd, uh, but also that the competition uh, brief didn't mention one of the scars that is just cutting in this uh, site. And uh, the location of the uh, project was set here. And then we were looking at uh, the at that site and wondering what's this uh, large scar in the landscape and we discovered that this is one of the largest military airfield that was set in the baltic states uh, it's an ex soviet military airfield and then looking at the history we saw that actually all the uh, riots were happening in this uh, land and uh, there were riots against the occupation that started from the city center to of Tartu and moving towards that land in uh, Radi. Uh, so for us, uh, the uh, question of building that museum was about really questioning that past and maybe trying to uh, escape the site that was given, given for the competition and to try to link to the, uh, the museum to the history, to link it to this platform and try to see uh, the building more uh, acting at a territorial scale as an urban regener regenerator, but also as a way to, uh, to claim that history, to maybe give it also another future. And the museum, in a way, becomes almost a land art that sits within the landscape and connects to that uh, airfield, opening also the identity of what a national structure could be, uh, and allowing people to inhabit that platform and to become a platform for culture to happen. And that was what was very interesting actually during the process and especially when we're starting to construct that building, it really felt uh, how uh, people were attached to that construction but also how this architecture becomes a place that is vocal for the nation itself. So all of the Estonians, uh, went uh, into a manifestation to uh, to like to put the first stone or the first uh, uh, like setting for the the building, and they walked as when they did their walk for independence from the city center towards that building. And then when we're looking at the program of the museum, and so this is like a forty thousand square meters project for a hundred thousand. Uh, 
uh, people actually in Tartu. So it's really a large building for such a small uh, city. But uh, what was interesting is to look at this notion of scale and maybe offer within inside uh, this uh, building a human scale. So all the, the functions within the buildings were inhabited by these small structures uh, that reflect on the scale of the house within the city. So really bringing back this human scale into the, uh, the structure of the museum. As we look at it at the landscape, so Estonia is uh, also particular with these extreme temperatures. In uh, winter time, it's minus uh, 20 degrees, and in summertime, it goes to uh, more over 25 degrees. Uh, so the museum really sits within this landscape and transforms in terms of its, uh, the way it is perceived also in this military landscape. So here in winter, it has this more poetic outlook. And uh, one thing also that we wanted to do is that the building is gowned with this uh, traditional pattern. So this is a pattern that uh, re like, uh, represents the cornflower, uh, which is a traditional pattern that was used by the many women knitting actually during the uh, times of uh, the occupation as an act of resistance also to, uh, uh, to these uh, moments. Uh, so we can see here uh, Anu Baud, who is a great uh, textile artist with all these uh, works that she, she have done. So the body of the building is really gowned with the same uh, traditional uh, pattern. We can see here like how the building also is announced more like a, uh, almost like a wing of an airplane, really talking about the memory of the site here. And as we enter, the building invites us into the scale of uh, the human uh, height. And so here we are more like on a high space with these uh, generous spaces. And actually, these spaces that are the open spaces become the ones where uh, the Estonians manifest their uh, culture. They inhabit this uh, environment because these are spaces that were unprogrammed, uh, what I like to call the uncertain spaces, where they can actually make their own activities and where it's just about uh, the link between uh, one function and the other. For example, this is the shop and the library and then uh, the uh, exhibition space. And these open spaces were always a challenge because the uh, museum-like uh, uh, committee, when we were designing the project, were trying to look for efficiency and trying to uh, look for spaces that only are programmed. And we were always like pushing to have these open spaces because we, we believe that these are the spaces actually where culture can be produced and can happen more than the programmed only spaces. And when we go out, the building disappears, so really playing between this uh, monumental aspect that uh, this building can, can have in the landscape and its possibility of disappearing and just becoming the landscape at another point. Just showing here a small movie that was done by a cinematographer in uh, Tartu. Uh, and we can see how they inhabit the space. And I always like to see how actually people like and artists inhabit spaces in a different way than we can imagine. So the first uh, view we've seen actually the lady knitting in the um, canopy of the building. So they had, like they used the structure of that canopy and filmed inside. And afterwards, when the building was uh, delivered, I was curious to hear people actually how what do you think what do they think actually about this museum and uh, one of the uh, urban uh, like de developers that uh, uh, developer that followed the project was saying that the museum here acts as a bridge between two shores in one side the past and in the other the future it is helping us to turn our heads from the past into the busy and innovative future full of meaning and drama Moving from that project into Beirut, and uh, here we're more talking about amnesia, about, the ident about memory, about what the city had uh, lived. Uh, and this is a residential project that, uh, that is sitting uh, along the port area of uh, Beirut. 
so we are really uh, in, in the context of the city that is in constant transformation that sometimes talk about the history where we can see uh, these uh, small, uh, these uh, uh, Lebanese, uh, typically Lebanese uh, red tiled uh, roof houses uh, being threatened by the developers' towers that are always constantly being built. Uh, something that we see all over the world, but is more in a dense uh, environment. Beirut is really an experimental ground and a place where we constantly these see these transformation uh, in a short span of time. Beirut is also a palimpsest where the history of the city is constantly rewritten. Uh, there's no one urban plan uh, that uh, that governs the city, but a stitching of uh, multiple uh, plans. We can see this drawing by Zarina Hashimi, where it really expresses the transformation of the city. Moments like this photography by Fouad al Kouri, where we can see these houses, these Lebanese uh, houses, uh, invaded by nature, but also the capacity uh, at some point also of architecture, of just being, like the stair is just a pleasure of having the stair outside. And we learn a lot about these situations uh, and this um, like spatial configurations within the city. The city of Beirut is also constantly at the verge of um, of a catastrophe, and at the same time, with that, uh, with this, these moments come really extreme moments of uh, living that are constantly present in the city. And the site of this project is really at the port, so it's very close to the city center. Uh, historically, uh, what the site was one of the uh, like um, uh, older uh, concrete factory, the Derwish had that uh, like uh, institution. But also the site was the house of uh, like the famous uh, Pierre Khoury, modernist architect, who had also his uh, office here. Uh, and then he gave away the land after he uh, passed away to his uh, son and uh, uh, daughter. Uh, and uh, Fouad al Kouri was his uh, son, he's a photographer. Uh, and what was interesting actually is that it's very close to the city center, to the city center of Beirut, Solidar was uh, renovated very quickly, uh, gentrified if we can say. Uh, but also by this uh, renovation, uh, we really lost the history of uh, the war and what uh, what it left in the city and all these scars. It's, uh, I always feel like it's like a body when you're uh, scarred, you need time to heal, you need to time to understand what had happened. And the fact of uh, uh, trying or forcing that uh, quick healing uh, left us with the amnesia actually uh, into what happened uh, after the war. And the systems and the political system actually really continues that uh, amnesia uh, that the city had lived. And one of the few memories of what uh, the city of Beirut had endured were recorded by Fouad al Khoury in uh, this book in 92 uh, that, uh, that compiles photos of Gabriel Basilico, of his photos of Robert uh, Frank and many other photographers that were commissioned by Solidaire to take photos of uh, the city center before they refurbish it. And we can see the, the whole, uh, you know, the city eaten up by, uh, by the war, uh, but also moments where we as humans become like our environment, frail, eaten up as well. So this uh, tower, when, we, when I came to design this project, was for me like suddenly plunging again with the, my upbringing in Beirut, with the thinking of how can a residential tower give back something to the city, or how can, uh, what does it express actually uh, in the city of Beirut? And then uh, the question of opening becomes very political. It really almost talks about, again, these moments where these snipers were just uh, standing on the uh, lines that are separating Beirut East and West, and then from these openings, observing the city, observing the citizens, and transforming uh, the uh, inhabitation within, uh, within the city. And the openings within the stone garden building become also devices to, to see the city differently and to frame it and to talk about its urban absurdities or its urban developments. So we can see these different uh, sizes of openings, moments where we can see also the port of Beirut. 
And moments where these double height uh, openings are really talking about memories like this open uh, cut within uh, an existing building. Of course, these uh, views are not ones that uh, emerge in a linear way while designing the projects. It was just afterwards when I was looking at these photos, I realized this connection actually that exists between the opening and between uh, the, the, uh, the lived history in, in the city. So the structure is all a concrete structure. Uh, Beirut is a seismic area, so it had to uh, live uh, an earthquake. And we can see here in the, in the moment of construction these like openings that are orchestrated within the uh, form. Uh, and then uh, moving further from that concrete shell, uh, the question was how, for me, how this building can express the belonging to the ground, almost like this eternal uh, form, uh, which is the uh, pigeon rock that, uh, that is one of the uh, like, uh, natural formation in the Mediterranean Sea that we can see in Beirut. But also, how can the skin, uh, that is a sensitive skin, uh, talk about uh, the craft or the hand of uh, many workers that are coming, fleeing the war in Syria, uh, coming from different contexts and coming to, to work on site in uh, Beirut. And this is where we, like I try to push for a um, handmade uh, structure and think about uh, the making of the facade almost as if we are combing uh, a facade or we are almost like uh, chiseling ground and bringing it vertically uh, like an archaeology in a way. And this process started by uh, looking at uh, forms uh, of clay in, uh, in the studio. Uh, and from that clay, trying with a fork uh, to make this shape of uh, horizontality, of really combing that or chiseling the ground. Uh, and then moving from there, like drawing the comb, and then after uh, making it a device uh, on the building, and then working with the uh, workers in place, the artisans, and uh, developing that technique. And uh, during that process, what was interesting is that actually the uh, workers became part of the emotional process of making. So sometimes they would come the next day and uh, tell me, oh, I, we, we knew how to do it. Uh, and they found the right uh, cooking, uh, uh, let's say, uh, mix, actually, to make this work. Uh, and and one other thing is also about how nature exists within the city. It's organic, and if you walk in Beirut, you can see these uh, uh, towers with the balconies, and um, they're inhabited by flower pots and with gardens. And uh, it was a practice that existed, and we thought that maybe that's, uh, this uh, the vegetation can be part of the structure of the building. So somehow talking also of the scales of nature that could exist within uh, the, uh, the living, and trying to have the double height for larger trees, the smaller window for a flower pot, and then allowing for these different scales to exist within uh, the same building. Nature, in a way, also grounds this uh, tower in, uh, in, the, uh, in the ground of the city in relation to also the, uh, the vegetation that exists uh, and tries to exist in Beirut. And the building really is really uh, following the, the sight lines. It's following its uh, plot uh, lines. And as we move within the city, we can see it really transforming by uh, the city itself and by these lines that invisibly shape our urban environment. In its context, it's really a kind of a modest uh, height for the building, because actually the, the exploitation factor can allow you also to grow very high. And here we decided rather to, uh, to really bring it in uh, relation to the whole site and rather uh, control its height. These windows also allow uh, maybe a critique to all these um, apartment buildings that are uh, developed by uh, many developers in the city. Uh, and we can see these mushrooming, like dictating the same uh, social uh, construct within the, uh, within the city. And the windows with their organicity are allowing really different uh, floor plane on every, um, every level and maybe individualizing, in a way, the inhabitation. 
we can see moments also where the entrance is this kind of a womb structure that uh, uh, like invite us into the intimacy of the living. The ground floor is dedicated for uh, the MENA Image Center, which is a platform for debate and uh, for uh, thought around uh, production in the Middle East. It's a raw space that is open for uh, uh, many interventions and artists to, uh, to work. This is something uh, like the work of artists is something that we wanted to show in the Biennale uh, that was headed by Hashim Sarkis. Uh, and uh, to, to think about in this exhibition uh, about this model for this uh, project as a tool actually uh, to show the work of many uh, artists in uh, Lebanon uh, that depict actu uh, actually Beirut and that depict the city, but to also think about the creative work as a way of questioning sometimes uh, the, uh, the environment, questioning and putting uh, forward difficult questions that we are unable to talk about and being really vessels of change. So we can see these photos within the uh, inside of, these, uh, of this model. Uh, we discover these uh, small videos that uh, also talk about uh, moments in the 80s after the war where pop people are were talking about their traumas and these traumas still exist uh, at the moment actually within the city. After the explosion that happened in uh, Beirut and the port area, the building withstood the ex this explosion, at least all the facade uh, that was hand worked, uh, except that, of course, all the windows were completely shattered. And it was really like a moment where w somehow what had uh, brought into uh, this project into being uh, was almost a repeated history. So really are uh, kind of uh, an archaeology of the future in a way. We can see here in the south facade, uh, this building actually, uh, like the south facade, is bound to be covered. This is why we can see very small openings that are really uh, rather destined to uh, kitchens or to uh, the, the all the WCs on this side and for ventilation uh, ducts, actually. Uh, but at the same time, they talk about the urban environment and all the shaping of the structure are, is coming from these uh, red lines that uh, that the legal like the uh, the legal uh, framework uh, is uh, as it is imposed on the uh, architecture of the building. These moments were also the uh, almost inhabiting the outside uh, in the Mediterranean climate with the planella. Uh, talking about the environment, uh, I would like to present this project also in um, Normandy. So here we move to France and how to uh, develop a project uh, that is uh, low carbon, that is uh, the first uh, uh, E4C2. In a way, it's an energy positive building and it's uh, low carbon construction. Uh, and when we're talking about an energy positive building, so it's not a passive building only, but it's able to distribute its energy, that brings us really to, uh, to think about the structure in complete uh, synergy with its technicity. And this is a manufacturing building, and it's set in a very industrial zone, so you are, you are surrounded by these tin metal tin uh, constructions that always transform a natural environment. So while we're uh, surrounded with this very beautiful uh, nature, uh, we're really transforming these environments. So it was a question, how do, we, how do we, through an industrial building, bring back beauty or bring back this connection with nature, with its color, with its texture, but also talk about the precision of the hand, because this is a place where we're making leather uh, manufacturing. Talk about this uh, micro scale that the leather brings us into, uh, but also this uh, notion of the trace and the hand trace on architecture. And uh, for this project, we started from the resource, uh, th since we're looking at how do we build with the resources in place. And when we were looking at what exists in place, we we we've seen that actually uh, this uh, the site is surrounded by three local brick uh, artisanal brick makers, 
And these brick makers were only working with um, uh, renovation bricks, and we decided through this project to bring back brick into uh, structural construction instead of only renovation. And then complement, of course, all this uh, thought or the starting point with this research that we always like carry on in, uh, in any project. And moving more technically to understand how to reach a low carbon energy positive building, we had to think about first the energy, the carbon footprint, but also how to bring that into an architecture that is able to bring well-being. And when we're talking about energy, we're talking about uh, this machine that is a manufacturing and almost an incremental work moving from a traditional building into a low and uh, passive building and in a building that is uh, able to sustain uh, itself. So f the first uh, like step was to uh, think about a bioclimatic building that really listens to its environment. Uh, that also as a program is the most compact possible. And in that sense, the grid was more uh, pertinent actually for a manufacturing uh, facility because it allows compactness, it allows modularity, it allows flexibility. Uh, and uh, somehow the square became like really the shape of this uh, program. Uh, where it is shaped by the modules of uh, the atelier of making, of manufacturing, that are all orchestrated around a meeting point for the artisans. And then thinking about basic resources, light, ventilation, and nature, and how to place the program in a relationship to light. For example, the atelier were taking use of the northern light, and then we had sheds to bring in uh, northern light into these ateliers and reduce our needs in electricity and uh, needs of um, uh, climatization, uh, the ventilation, nature. So when it's surrounded by nature, the facade uh, was protected from the sun rays. And when uh, actually in winter time, when the leaves, uh, we, when the trees le uh, lose their leaves, uh, the facade is then um, heated by, uh, by the sun, so reducing our need in uh, climatization and in cooling, uh, cooling and heating of the building. Then the south part was protected by these courtyards that uh, cast shadow on the south facade. And then the landscape became both uh, like a journey, uh, kind of an experience into the building, but also a way uh, to create awareness about this ecosystem that is surrounding us. And by doing this clim bioclimatic approach, we uh, We've seen, we've saw, we saw actually by simulating the, the building that we get closer to this uh, zone of, co of comfort for human beings and we actually need less uh, energy to, uh, to sustain the project. Uh, and then we uh, use renewable energies, whether solar panels and geothermal uh, energies that are lower in carbon than any other uh, type of uh, energy intake. And then from the carbon footprint, we started calculating every material we are using, uh, whether like using uh, wood, uh, wood structure instead of uh, metal one, uh, bricks instead of concrete, et cetera, and using the earth to manufacture the bricks. And when we started uh, like excavating on site, we started, we were really happy to start the project. And then we discovered archeology. span and of course the client told me because you're you like archaeology of the future so we <laughs> discovered archaeology we were lucky actually that that was the moment where we had COVID, so we had the time to dig in and we uncovered that the site actually contained um, a magdalenian uh, foyer uh, that dated 16,000 years uh, and that actually people were again working by hand and uh, using the tools uh, at that moment. So somehow, maybe in an invisible way, we're always connected to our environment, to this earth that really unveils a lot of the histories in place. So we worked with the local uh, artisan uh, brick maker and we uh, manufactured 500,000 bricks. Uh, they were cooked in this uh, Hoffman ovens that are elliptical in shape uh, and uh, made in a traditional way. Uh, cooked here, we can see uh, this uh, oven where they were uh, placed. 
they were dyed dried and then uh, when they are cooked they have multiple colors so we use, use these colors to create uh, like the uh, various uh, tints of the uh, elevation itself and when we came on site we discovered that actually uh, we don't have any more skilled labor that are able to build uh, uh, with structural bricks so we had to take a master mason that uh, like that formed actually uh, uh, other uh, masons into brick making and into brick construction again w one thing that i found magical was also that the um, drawings that we made were printed into one to one scale and then the uh, masons were really uh, starting their work with the drawing itself leaving the trace of the uh, masonry into the, uh, the the drawing itself they were guides in the beginning to be able to follow the the arches that we were uh, designing you can see here as they built and uh, actually one thing also that uh, the natural shape uh, for a span in uh, brick uh, in brick is an arch and we try to work on this thinness actually of the arch optimizing uh, all the material used calculating how much we how can we optimize the use also of this material to bring this thinness but also to use exactly what we need uh, for the construction the shape of this arch was studied in terms of uh, its form to give the slightness, also to give uh, almost this feeling of gallops uh, of these horses. Because this is also a place where uh, saddleries is, uh, are made. Uh, and uh, like this uh, house that is working on, um, uh, on leather work is uh, known for uh, saddlery making. We see these lines that are continuing and that are highlighted by light. And as we enter the building, we enter into an outside, we enter into nature before entering the realm of the, uh, like of the ateliers. Uh, we can see also in the construction process, really these natural material that emerge. So really the construction process becomes also a, a very uh, warm one. It really informs on the architectonic of uh, making. Uh, so we have this uh, brick uh, structures, but th then the uh, roof of the building is made out of uh, wood, so almost knitted uh, slowly. Uh, and then we enter into this uh, structure, into this outside uh, space where nature is growing uh, slowly. Uh, it's a place also where people uh, and the, the, the artisans working within this uh, like structure are niched, uh, they, they smoke, they meet, uh, they pass, uh, or they sit uh, along the restaurant or the canteen. Then entering into this uh, space that is a meeting point inside before uh, one gets into the um, uh, atelier of, of work. And here we can see how the arch is somehow echoing the shapes of uh, the forms that the artisans are working with. And these saddleries are also, again, continuing these shapes that are surrounding them. And they give like softness also within the space. And then we move into uh, office spaces where they are uh, meeting and uh, thinking about ways of uh, innovating in their work, uh, moments of conviviality. And the all the ateliers are interlinked to one another through these openings that uh, create dialogue. And then as we enter, we see these uh, sheds uh, of light that uh, are coming in. So this is more northern light that allows really the precision of work to happen. Uh, and the leather actually have the same color of the bricks uh, surrounding the building. So it more most recently, like when we look at the uh, uh, like the landscape is growing and the landscape is made out of the same excavation earth so we use the, the earth that is excavated to uh, to create these landscapes here and to reshape a more natural environment with aromatic plants but also there are some uh, uh, apple trees and uh, other fruits that are grown with around this uh, uh, manufacture and what we can see here are benches that are where the uh, workers can sit. And these uh, are made out of the uh, formwork uh, that are used uh, for the arch making. 
and then also, of course, looking at an ecosystem at large uh, with uh, like the bees that find also their house here. So the building is a tool, it becomes a tool for the living and it uh, maybe is able to, uh, to live in time uh, and to express uh, the uh, this uh, gallops of the horse within that environment. Just finalizing also this, uh, or like two final projects to uh, uh, to explain one quickly is uh, um, a building in uh, France, but th that th the, the the research behind that building led also to the uh, thoughts behind the uh, Serpentine Pavilion. Uh, so this is a project that uh, has won the call for innovative project of the city of Paris, uh, and uh, it was an open call for projects to to be developed out of scratch. So no pro program was set uh, before. Uh, and we developed uh, this project around sustainable feeding. So thinking about how within the same structure we can talk about uh, food and food culture and a more like how can we eat in a more sustainable way. So to cultivate, to, uh, to be cultivated, but also to uh, talk about circular economy. Uh, and we thought about a place where a whole ecosystem can uh, can be put in place, where we can plant, where we can live, where we can transmit, we can uh, compost and somehow interlink uh, this uh, uh, ecosystem together. And we also have a place of conviviality where the neighbors can meet. It's a wooden structure, it's uh, low carbon uh, in its footprint. It's structure that is really uh, with these uh, ramps that interlink the whole uh, uh, levels are about also a meeting place between the different inhabitants of this tower. And moving from that, uh, the uh, proposal of uh, the Serpentine Pavilion is a call to, to be together and to be brought together around the same table. Uh, it's about a moment of conviviality, but it's also a moment where we think about our relationship to Earth, maybe through food or through uh, food in a way uh, that the table is uh, symbolically uh, echoing that uh, notion. And food because it's also how we are questioning how we are uh, anchored to the environment, how, how we're rooted in our climates, but also looking at moments of um, the significance of uh, meeting around the table in history. For example, if we look at the symposium uh, in uh, Greek times, it's a moment where decisions were also made, and this is where decisions are made also today. Uh, we looked at, for example, the Stonehenge as a moment of con like also convenience between uh, people, a moment of manifestation, of assembly, of decision, uh, and thought about other assembly structures like the Tuguna structure in Mali uh, that is built by the Dogon people, uh, and where uh, people are like the wise uh, people of the village meet together, and they have stay, uh, to f stay seated under this, under this heavy roof uh, until they uh, reach important decisions. And th the lowness of the roof allows them actually to stay nonviolent because as soon as they stand up, they bump their heads. So it's a great like uh, example to see how can architecture actually allow this uh, moment of uh, stillness and agreement looking at uh, forms, uh, natural forms, to inform also the structure of this pavilion that is made out of these two columns that are uh, holding this uh, like, uh, like span, actually, uh, that is uh, allowing this meeting point in the center. We can see here the roof that looks uh, like a leaf structure with these main uh, ribs and then the secondary uh, structure that are holding the, the hole. And this pavilion is about more interiority, about a moment of intimacy, rather about uh, than about the spectac spectacularity of its architecture uh, outside. So it invites one to sit, to dwell, to take the time, uh, a time that is very much needed today. Uh, and then also allowing these uh, dual moments between the, uh, when we're seated in a more uh, ordinary way around the center and moments of uh, scenography where we're in the middle of this structure itself.
Thank you so much. while our uh, dear speaker catches her breath and maybe uh, gets a last cup of water. Um, I'm going to introduce myself and have the uh, pleasure and the challenging task of uh, engaging uh, Lina's beautiful I work in the conversation. So I'm uh, Rania Rousson. I'm an associate professor of architecture here at MIT. And um, I was invited to uh, join Lina in conversation, both a celebration of her exquisite work and kind of a conversation on maybe um, the possibilities of uh, material practices maybe captured by archaeology and the term and the possibilities of that future that remain open. So um, I guess I'm partially here because I, we also share a hometown. Uh, or a, a home country at least. And that part of that um, kind of asks models of practice that might depart from that moment of living in, um, living with trouble, staying with the trouble and figuring out modes of practice maybe that might be generative out of that moment. So some of maybe my thoughts would come out of that. They're a bit scrambled all over the place. So bear with me because I think I'm, I'm, I'm working at the same time with this one, a complete sense, probably I'll join Nasser in that of achievement, of uh, being able to establish a practice as a kind of a person with a hyphen identity, uh, Lebanese, French, French Lebanese, probably Arab American, French Lebanese at this point, and always having that either responsibility or burden of being tied back to a place of presenting one's work through a specific lens, but achieving that with impeccable distinction. So I'm, I'm in awe of all your achievements and will celebrate that. Um, and I think the question to me is kind of what do we get out of um, archaeology as a practice? Uh, so I, you know, digging back to <laughs> what archaeology um, is, and it's by some definition, the study of material remains um, of past life and activities. It comes from the Greek uh, referring to um, archaeal, ancient things, and the logos, the theory or, or the science. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of both thinking of what that term archaeology does in its work and maybe where it tests its limit. Um, I'm trying to think of it if it's kind of a model of practice or a metaphor for the practice in that sense. But I think you capture beautifully in various moments what, what archaeology can do. So maybe one at one level, it kind of pushes against the amnesia of the recent past or the recent history or the challenges of looking back to anything which is less than 100 years old in that context and by reaching out to maybe less divisive or aspirationally less divisive <laughs> uh, framework. So, and doing that not necessarily through kind of a, a, um, a narrative structure exclusively or a discursive structure, but um, heading back to the material forms of evidence. So drawing back on material and drawing back on ancient forms of practice to open up possibilities for imagining a future that might be otherwise foreclosed. So the archaeologist is first a descriptive worker. She has the challenge or the task of describing, classifying, analyzing, studying past material practices, past form, 
establishing various forms of taxonomies, and that, of course, can be a life worth of work. But then your task doesn't end there because you kind of move from the descriptive to invite us to be able to imagine other forms of assembly. So uh, kind of from the work of excavation and digging to actually place, relate these materials remains in, in new context. So in that sense, maybe the archeologist becomes again a historian, one that has an interpretive description of a, of a past but mostly maybe a craftsperson, which I think is where your talk beautifully kind of converges across the Hermes factory, across the kind of the, the, the stone tower in Beirut, to these various forms of recovering forms of past labor and maybe uh, kind of bridge, bringing the innovation that is often aspired to future by saying it might not rest very far from, from, from the contemporary moment. So, um, of course, it begs its own questions on the politics of labor that are available in such contexts that might rely on regional crisis to make such, such labor available. But that's, a, that's maybe a, a sideline. But maybe the question uh, that I want to think with is, so archaeology does a few things. It allows you to center craft. It also, and I think beautifully, allows you to evade maybe the limited programming that kind of architecture and its typology might do to celebrate like the Estonian Museum, moments where you can recover an architecture beyond program, not in the now, but maybe because of that possible imaginary of the future ruin already here, that it allows you to recover all of architecture, all of the building from kind of the, the, uh, uh, the hegemony of, of the program. Um, so, if architect, if archaeology does all of that for architecture, I guess the question is, um, what does the architect, as a as a future archaeologist, or as an, uh, what does the architect, as a as a con contemporary of a future archaeology, imagine the lives of that building? Is it kind of a building that is inevitably in ruin, <laughs> and is that imagination of the ruin kind of an important one in this future? orientation is it one that says I can learn from deeper history I'm engaged in longer durees this building is here maybe now uh, its materiality might come back some of it to the earth some of it might remain as kind of a material trace to be variously inhabited but I think in that um, in that openness maybe I'm asking you to I don't know if beauty has to respond to kind of a question of ethical responsibility in that task of the material inscription of a future ruin. But maybe if it's not an ethical responsibility, almost a historical consciousness. So what moment of the contemporary does your architecture want to register as an archaeology of the future? What is it? What does it desire if it were to write its own archaeology now? What does it desire to be seen, to be lived, to be recovered, to be digged? And does it at some point, you know, in all kind of disciplinary project, maybe face the challenges of archaeology as being kind of historically tied to the rise of nationalism and the closure that that model of practice had, right? Either initially the Renaissance saying, we're not happy with the recent past, let's go to ancient Greece and ancient Rome, or let's go to the Orient and figure out some of, you know, some of the ruins there, extract them and bring them, bring them back to kind of museums. So I'm wondering, you know, where is your love for archaeology reside? And maybe where are some of the moments where you're, to use your term, maybe in resistance with it? Like where it does some of the work, but you're happy to leave it for maybe other capacities, for it to do other work. Thank you so much, uh, Rania. That's a uh, beautiful, uh, actually, reading and very poetic one because it just opened my mind uh, uh, to, to many uh, thoughts. Um, I think like uh, I think you describe it very well actually like the different uh, what archaeology brings into uh, the architecture and what does it bring in the process of thinking and uh, for me there is a sense of uh, rather than seeing a building as an archaeology itself in a literal way uh, it's about a process where uh, one is uh, rather uh, linked uh, to the material, to linked to, to earth in a way, anchored in its place, because once you're an archaeologist, you're really forced to look at the environment, you're forced to 
to dig, to find traces, and to look to these traces and build a story. And your story is never one that is uh, the absolute truth, because it's a story that you're building out of what you find, and your story is constantly in movement, is constantly changed as you find another, uh, uh, you get another finding, and you stitch these together, and you're always anchored in that context. And that anchorage, that uh, that relationship to uh, the environment that is brought in archaeology is very precious. But also the capacity of uh, of looking at uh, at what existed and at, at, at the form of architecture as one that is weathering uh, is also bringing a certain uh, se in, in a certain sense a humility. Uh, to architecture and the possibility of uh, the architect not being the object of uh, what is being made, but being just a vessel actually, and allowing the uh, the space to to exist beyond beyond the the, uh, the agent that had uh, maybe figured it out and made it in, at a certain uh, moment in time. Uh, and that also is uh, somehow bring us to the ruin, as you say, uh, because the ruin is uh, is a way also of uh, bringing the uncertain again, both in the program and the fact that uh, uh, you're not the program is just an instance in the process of making architecture, the and it can uh, the the function or the the structure itself can go beyond its program. It could be another program tomorrow. For example, the Tower of Stone Garden at some moment after the explosion became just a space uh, that is invaded by nature where the facades were closed by the wooden uh, uh, like st structure and it, you could almost imagine it becoming a whole ruin or just a platform for art on every level uh, or the structure for the industry in uh, for Hermès could become a cloister, could become a museum maybe in the future. So it goes beyond its uh, stigma as a function in itself. So it opens the field actually of uh, prototyping uh, architecture to a very specific uh, form. I think the limitation of the archaeology is just uh, when it brings you only to the past. And as architects, we are trying also to, uh, to to outlive the past and to be situated in the present and allow for for future inhabitation, for appropriations to happen, also uh, for uh, for humans and for living to uh, you know to 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 take grasp of our buildings, but also of new stories to happen, not only to build what had been there and uh, to be stuck uh, in what had happened. But all this brings you in a, in a way to think about the making of architecture as, uh, in an, uh, as a way that is not linear, that is not a process of uh, moving from a concept to, uh, an idea to, to a drawing, to a construction, but also as a moment that is always uh, circular in a way, where time is rather seen in a circular manner, where research is always feeding the project. When you come on site, you start to question actually what you have uh, designed, and it questions the uh, the whole uh, cycle because you find things there that because the craft people become the archaeologists at the moment building the future because they're building with the material and they're, uh, they're bit by bit constructing again and they feed uh, the process of design again. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll have a second thought but I might want to save it and then I'm sure there's a few questions that are uh, in the audience today, so we can take a few of those if that sounds good, and then we can continue the conversation. You're up to the test. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I was scared presenting the museum with a tattoo. Um, thank you so much for such a poetic and um, human centric uh, presentation. I really uh, loved it. Um, so the museum in Tartu, I um, grew up very close to that place. And it was actually not only a military airport, it was a um, nuclear airport. So highly secretive, the whole town was off the maps, right, because of that very airport. And I remember it was the kind of the biggest scar of the town. Um, I remember breaking into that airport and running through three layers of barbed wire with my friends 
into the airplane runways and as a kid and escaping without getting shot. Um, and I think the use of that scar as a symbol of kind of redefinition of what that space is for is, is really powerful uh, and reminds me, in fact, of the work of the other Lina in um, Brazil. Um, Lina Bobardi's work in CEPT, which takes these old factories of Sao Paulo and redefines them as cultural spaces, as libraries, as cultural centers, etc. It really struck that chord of it's really a way of redefining what a space used to be um, and reminding people of it very explicitly through the form of the building and many other aspects, but giving it a new frame uh, that people can project onto. And I, I wondered if you could speak a little bit more of that side of the archaeology, of sort of creating, many of your buildings I think are, as you say, like frames that allow, they're not super specific to a function, they allow certain life to take over um, and, and uh, redefine new purposes in them. Thank you. It's really uh, interesting also to hear you actually about uh, the lived experience of that uh, ruddy area of uh, the airfield. Because it's always striking actually to see how, uh, you know, the city was is quite dense in uh, Tartu. I mean, it's also the, like uh, you have these houses and uh, in, in these parks, and suddenly it just cuts down when you when you see the ruddy developing uh, area. It has this particular landscape also with these bunkers that uh, where the the planes are uh, parked, and today they become really poetic scenery is actually transformed. So this kind of duality of uh, reading of this context. Um, I think the meeting point with the airfield was, of course, a very controversial one as well. When we won the project at that time, uh, there was a lot of uh, controversial uh, uh, articles and, uh, and, uh, and debates around that. And some of the uh, press uh, around the project was like uh, these architects coming from different uh, places of the world, monumentalizing the Russians, uh, transform like linking to this uh, airfield we want to forget this history why do we need mon monumentalize that uh, uh, that airfield uh, and what was interesting at that point is that the building actually which is a national museum uh, opened up for a debate it's not anymore uh, uh, just an icon a nice beauty museum sitting in its context but it's a debate about the history about how do we deal with such a uh, such remains, how do we deal with our past? What does architecture actually mean here? What is a national uh, museum? Uh, is it just a building that is uh, talking about our dusty past? And this is a quote from an article that was uh, published. Uh, or is it about uh, like talking about our identity that is in constant construction? And this is where I realized actually the, the capacity of architecture to open narratives, to all talk about the past, but is also transform sometimes our relationship to that past and think about the the, uh, the meaning of uh, these cars that and also our tight relationship as bodies that we have in uh, to to our built scape to our landscape. And, and this is powerful for, for me as an architect, is really how we are very much connected to these physical remains uh, around us and the projected meaning that we can have and how space can transform these pro projected meanings as well. I love this idea of almost inhabiting the scar. Like I'm reminded of the slide that you showed with the obelisk still in sight. And it seems the kind of monument that you're working with through this architecture is less the obelisk when it's erect and more the empty space of the dig that it leaves behind. And the possibility of maybe rather than just covering it, the possibility of using the trace or that scar to actually keep that conversation open, to keep that debate open as almost the only way to get to that historical process. So if archaeology is to serve history, it may be actually working in that space of disagreement 
rather than just, you know. Yeah, this is uh, interesting actually to, to bring the question of disagreement, of contradiction that is constantly possible and contradiction as a way also of advancing uh, through, through difference that we are able actually to, to bring this uh, third space <laughs> that we can talk about here and uh, allow for other things to happen. And through this connection, actually, the platform became a place of activity and of uh, um, maybe of utopia that could happen in this place. Like I remember, I don't know if you've seen this uh, super Metallica concert that happened on the airfield. <laughs> there were like thousands of people just uh, like standing on this airfield uh, and, and the Metallica were just on the entrance of the building and they were raving <laughs> uh, on this space. So it suddenly became like an event place, a uh, place of appropriation of trans transformation uh, over the ground of the nuclear uh, you know, past. Um, can I just say Hello? Thank you for the uh, wonderful uh, presentation. Really, um, really fascinating. And I think... You don't mind, we... we if you can um, uh, and I think what captivated me the most was just um, the the first um, uh, of the different sections of resist of architecture as resistance was the first of resisting occupation um, and I think uh, architecture through that lens is uh, what first interested me or engaged me in architecture and ultimately what brought me here. Um, so I was wondering um, um, beyond that project, um, which looked to sort of the 1990s and, and previously, um, what, what are your thoughts on the role of architecture in the contemporary world? Uh, of resisting occupation around the world. I think, like, um, I mean, as architects, we uh, we're always tools of power. You know, we're always like commissioned sometimes by states. We're commissioned by uh, uh, by people with means, and uh, but at the same time, we have the critical capacity to to think over how how do we how do we to, like outturn our commissioners how do we critically uh, assess the space how do we uh, you know work with the contradiction sometimes of the commissions we have and how do we open up other fields how do we create new relations how do you question histories of uh, uh, of injustice that could happen and and that's what's fantastic about our work as architects as creatives or as artists uh, in in the field of society this one this is kind of cool this is more cool i don't know if it sounds like a yeah, whiskey uh, but <laughs> Works, right? L Lina, you're astounding. Your work is astounding, and the the, the this you, the piece you bring to us at this special moment, difficult moment, is astounding. Thank you so so much. Uh, I want to go back to your narrative, to uh, Rania's amazing interpretation of it, in-depth interpretation of it, and uh, the notion of the archaeological and architecture. And I have to say, as much as I appreciate the way that you've extracted from archaeology many, many inspirations. Uh, there is something in your work which transcends that inspiration, and I think it takes it to an another level. And that has to do with the way you meet the ground. Uh, I mean, the, I, again, you, you, your work is astounding in its m modesty in relation to the ground, which archaeology is never, archaeology is never modest in relation to the ground. It defies it by being so present. But all of your projects have something in them which is, at one level, they, lend them, they present themselves as being earthworks, but they are not. Because your museum in Estonia, when you turn around, it becomes a bridge. 
right? It becomes light on the ground. Its materiality goes from concrete to glass, uh, showing a certain lightness in relationship to the earth. Even the Beirut building, I'm going to say that uh, going out on a limb, uh, when you are on the ground looking through it, when you have an alignment of the windows, it, it lifts, it rises above the ground, it, it sort of floats. So I, and I'm, I'm seeing it also in the other projects, right? I mean, every one of them, the galloping brick wall becomes floating on the earth. So I, I have a feeling your project is going in a, in a direction that takes archeology span with it to a point where maybe another metaphor is needed for it to be in relation to the earth, not the archeological, but so something else. I don't know what it is, but I just wanted to ask you to, to tell us something about how you meet the ground. This is a great question. Thank you so much, Hashim. Um, I think like the ground is the one that is really uh, very much a question, actually, always in, uh, in the work. And uh, thinking about this tension, how do you relate to the ground as a material? Uh, as an earth, I mean, if you come the, to the uh, to my atelier, you, uh, you have these materials. Uh, Hannah, I, I saw one of the. <laughs> she's uh, she was uh, training at my office, and uh, you have these uh, remainings, these uh, models, and all of them look like the ground. They have this color that is uh, brownish, like a palette of brown and then you have plants and and there is always I, I notice and of course always it's a post rationale you look at this oh, why I have as people come in and you're like very earthly colors and it's about this uh, understanding of the ground as a color as a different as a material itself and uh, how how to link to it but it also creates a tension always like thinking about how do we uh, how how a project emerges from uh, from this resource from this material, but also how it gets its uh, maybe identity, how it gets its uh, persona as it floats. When you're talking about the uh, Hermes workshops, I was thinking it's true actually that it's it's almost uh, trying to escape the ground with this movement of the horse with the gallops, and at the same time being emerging from there, but it's really escaping it at the same time. Uh, Beirut project is also about the vertical ground, uh, so it maybe the contradiction uh, happens with the fact that it's, uh, it duplicates the ground. It tells that I'm also a ground in a way. If you look down, you're like almost looking at a uh, ground that is uh, uh, like uh, uh, calmed, uh, yeah, straightened, that is ready to be seeded, and you'd see the nature coming in, and even the birds, and uh, you know the ecosystem living within it uh, vertically. What can it uh, talk about metaphorically? I don't know. Is it uh, looking for an alternative ground to uh, to develop or a new spatiality that is able to bring another time uh, and space? Uh, in relation to its context, maybe to suspend time uh, in a certain way. Uh, I'm not sure what it could be also uh, theoretically as a, as a development yet. It's it's this contradiction also that is um, also interesting. Like the museum in Estonia is about monumentality from one side, as you enter into the building, this kind of massive uh, cantilever that actually was generated by just the drawing of the old site that was assigned to the competition. So it was just a line like this that cut the entrance and generated this uh, cantilever in a way. But suddenly it talks about the wings of the plane. But also with this monumentality, the building completely disappears at the other side and becomes another ground in a way. But it does also have its tension with this monumental side. It is to develop. I, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> hey, thank you for your uh, lecture and your work. Um, I appreciated that you showed projects with multiple materialities. Um, I was wondering 
the one that stood out to me was uh, the, the Hermes project in relation to your larger narrative because bricks present in the archeological past. Um, I was wondering, one significant thing that you said was that you wanted to use brick as a primary structure um, and it's been used less and less throughout history for its primary structure. So I was wondering, um, what do you project brick's purpose to be in the future um, as it relates to its capacities? Um, it has structural capacity, but it's been used less for that. Um, I mean, the use of bricks uh, in this context was, uh, in a way, pushing forward uh, like the process of making uh, a building or an architecture and thinking about uh, the, uh, the design through the material. And of course, we are more and more brought to do that because we're, if we're aiming for uh, more durable, more ecological constructions, we have to first look at what are our resources. So what do we build with? Recycled materials or resources in place and brick was actually what we found there. But also the br bricks and constructing with bricks brings you back to the scale of the hand. And it forced actually the design of the building to be measured by that uh, measurement of the brick itself, by the hand, and to be really uh, built one by one through this uh, brick actually, especially if you're working with a structural brick. So it's a very interesting process because it brings you to the precision again of the constructive element of uh, the uh, of the building. And I think if you're uh, thinking about how this can um, become a tool, uh, let's say, to, to foresee it in the future, uh, and uh, modestly I'm not able to foresee neither the future, but uh, I think uh, it was interesting to combine uh, that uh, vernacular way of constructing with the tools that we had nowadays with calculating in an engine like uh, the, the number of bricks uh, allowing for uh, a thin construction uh, etc that allows us to push also the material used in that sense and further uh, more like recently I was uh, in a lecture uh, in Vienna and I encountered uh, um, like uh, researchers in uh, Stuttgart that are working on bricks also uh, as they are built with um, uh, robotics uh, and somehow looking at brick as a way also of casting shadows on the facades in a way through this three-dimensionality of uh, brick laying it allows the facade to become a cooling uh, device uh, and uh, to create shadows on the streets uh, in a way to uh, to reduce uh, heat um, heat gains and uh, to solve uh, you know uh, global warming issues that are uh, that cities are a subject more and more to maybe a possibility yeah, it seems that almost i know that gst will have you back in the spring uh, so maybe part of this is more visits here to mit it seems like with the material interest that um, Kaylin Mueller and Sheila Kennedy, two of my colleagues, are proposing with respect to kind of the climate crisis that there's an interest to materiality, almost like a like an ecological vernacular, but that seems like it's heading towards possibility of being amplified not only through forms of manual labor, but also the possibilities of fabrication and what that might open as a next project. And so, yeah, that seems like a possibly uh, exciting possible next step. If you don't mind, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. All right, then we have the <laughs> um, Sorry to redirect the conversation away from materiality, but uh, Lena, so thank you so much for the presentation. Beautiful work. Um, I was looking at the Serpentine Pavilion, and you have this concept philosophy of a table, and I, I was wondering how your creative process works at the office, at the atelier, and if you implement this philosophy of bringing everyone to the table in the sense of you know interns, designers, junior designers, and yourself, and saying incorporating and bring everyone to the table in this concept, is that part of your creative process or is this just a completely misreading of the pavilion? Mm. Thank you. No, it's, it's not very mysterious actually. Uh, maybe Hannah can reply. <laughs> Um, I think like what's uh, interesting in the office is that we have a big table too. We have a large table at the entrance and this is a really a place of conviviality where all the team meets and uh, 
have lunch, but also where we meet around projects and uh, and walls in the office are also means to pin up, uh, you know, ideas, researches, and the process is really always rising with research, and uh, and most of the time it takes the the shape of a booklet uh, that precedes any project. So we start, for example, with an exhibition design or with the uh, with a project um, housing or a museum, and we start to emerge questions. We we think of different branches of. Uh, uh, of uh, notions that we want to explore. We look at uh, histories that had been in place and we bring them to become like a book, a narrative book. And sometimes we print it, we, we lay it on a wall uh, and then we experiment in models and then we get together, we look at these and the uh, drawings, etc. So it is uh, similar to this idea of a table in a way that at the same time, sometimes it allows uh, people to sit together independently without really communicating and doing their own uh, work and other pa pa parts it becomes a place of discussion of being together really and as in the serpentine becomes like a program uh, uh, around one speaker or different performance in the middle All right so in that spirit of companionship breaking bread together I think we're all gonna 